Hey everyone, we're at the AMD Next Horizon event and I'm joined by David Cantor. David Cantor has joined us a few times now and runs Real World Tech at realworldtech.com, one of the most technical outlets. I don't know, have you, have you posted stuff there lately? You're mostly in the forums um, now. I, 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 I'm more active in the forums, okay. but I've had a couple of things on uh, interesting process technology related uh, innovations in the think in the last six months. Cool. So if, <laughs> Not, if you wonder where, where I go to read stuff, it would be his website. Yeah. And then uh, we're going to be talking about Navi today, but David also works on mlperf.org. Yeah. And so we'll just plug that. If you're interested in machine learning benchmark performance, you can check out mlperf.org for some of David's yeah. work over there. Before that, this video is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare makes it easy to learn skills and advance yourself professionally with classes available for just about everything. We found the JavaScript Toolkit class taught by Christiane Heilman, a senior developer at Microsoft, to be of notable interest for our audience. The class is an intro on how to get started with JavaScript and cover skills you need to be marketable for web development. Skillshare costs $10 per month on an annual subscription, or click the link in the description below for a two-month free trial of Skillshare Premium. My baby for the last 11 months mm -hmm. has been getting the inference benchmarks together, which is once we have a trained neural network, you know, how do we classify things or predict things right. or uh, recognize images? And so it's been really exciting to get out that out the door and then also work on some of the power measurement uh, for those kinds of systems. Cool. Uh, on Navi, you also know a good bit about this because you've spoken with the architects. David was at the event with us. So uh, should we start with, let's, let's do a really top level, I guess, key changes. Yeah. Versus Vega, because one of the biggest things, Mike Mantor, his big point he was driving to our group of press was, uh, he said, by the end of this, I hope to convince you all that this is actually a new architecture. Yeah. And that's what he said. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I think for context, you, you know, AMD uh, has a somewhat challenging starting point, right? Which is they're in all the consoles. Mm. And for all the console guys, as well as for the, the, the PC folks, in an ideal world, we want the software that was written over the last seven years since the start of GCN to run well on Navi. Yeah. And so that kind of backwards compatibility is uh, constrains some of your innovation. You can't go too wild and crazy. Whereas, you know, you look at NVIDIA and, you know, every couple generations they're tearing things up and rebalancing. But that does mean that if you wrote software for Maxwell, that's probably not going to run optimally right. on something on like Turing. Turing yeah. Right. And so the question for AMD is, is very much how do we deliver a forward looking path of innovation while also having everything that we was written before, especially for the consoles, run really Still effectively. Still work, yeah. Yeah, and so, you know, the the philosophy behind Navi, I think, is is quite different than GCN and Vega and Polaris. And, right. You know, I think one is this philosophical change, uh, which I would say is he probably talked to you about IPC and building a, a wider compute unit. Yes, and and having higher effective instructions per clock, uh, right. higher clock speeds in, in the cases that we've seen so far. Right. Uh, and then also talked a lot about, there were, there's one really basic thing I wanted to, well, so ba the basic waves. in that I, I want a top level yeah. explanation. So one of the things in the presentations for context, when we come out to these events, architecture and tech days, uh, Andy's got someone from basically everywhere in the company yep. representing their, their spot. And uh, so you have product specifications, then you have like really low level architecture. Yep. And the two don't necessarily know about each other's uh, area of expertise. So on the architecture side, I'm not an expert there. And uh, one of the things that Mike Mantor kept mentioning was waves. Yeah. So wave 32 versus wave 64. Let's let's start with yeah. what is that? Right. <laughs> what well, is well, a wave? Well, hold on. So let's step back and okay, I, I want to take back. it a little bit more basic okay. and kind of talk a little bit about the philosophy. Okay. So, you know, when we look at performance, uh, realistically, there's a, a good mental model is you've got everything today is a multiprocessor. So you've got N cores and then if you want to make the whole solution faster, you can do, do more cores or you can do a faster core. 
Sure. Right, and, and from the CPU side, which applies to the GPU side here, the way to get a faster core is either higher clock speed, right, or more instructions per cycle, more work per cycle. Which we've seen with Ryzen discussion as well. Right, exactly. And so, uh, conceptually, if you look at the Vega architecture, uh, the main lever for performance there is more cores, more mm -hmm. compute units. And so you got to go wider. And uh, with Navi and the uh, RDNA architecture, the big shift is to say, actually, what we want to do is we want to go faster mm -hmm. on a per core basis so that we maybe don't need as many cores. In part Should I, let me do one quick interruption. When you say the word cores. I mean compute units. Okay. You know, everyone, <laughs> so, so look, NVIDIA, yeah. Intel, everyone who does something that computes will have a special name for it. Fortunately, the CPU guys all agree and they call them cores. Right. So that's the term I like to use because I'm originally a CPU and, guy. And then just very quickly, we had this discussion in a separate video you can watch, but, yes. but very quickly, your definition of a core. Right, is, is sort of your basic compute pipeline that is going to be fetching instructions, decoding instructions, executing them, uh, and then you know writing the results right. back and reading and writing to memory. So when David's saying cores, it is not uh, streaming processors. Yeah, no, no, no. You know, and so so a lot of the GPU guys like to call their floating point units a core or a stream processor or, or whatever. Right. And I, I really mean, you know, an NVIDIA parlance, an SM, in an AMD parlance, a compute unit. Right, right. So the. You know, on the Navi side, you said they're focusing on going faster, faster. and narrowing. They've narrowed it a bit. A, a so, bit, yeah. yeah. And, and so this gets to into like what a wave is. So when you look at the programming model for GPUs, the whole idea is we're going to run one program on every pixel on the screen, mm. right? And so, but we want to do that with a vector execution unit, right? And so that means that we can do a multiplication on a bunch of pixels at the same time, but they've got to be running the same instruction, right? So, so if we wanted to translate mm -hmm. or rotate, you're going to be doing a matrix multiplication on every single pixel. Okay. So, but you grab all those pixels together. And if uh, you've ever looked at you know, some of the NVIDIA white papers, they'll call this a warp. Yes. I'm right, and so that, that's yeah. a bunch of data items that you're going to process together. So is, is NVIDIA's warp to and these wave, they are the yes. same concept. Yes, and, and every GPU will have a very similar construction. Okay. So Intel's integrated graphics also has, uh, you know, something like this. And so the whole idea is this is a bunch of data elements that you all process together in the microarchitecture. Now, okay. So one of the big changes with Navi is in previous generations the waves were 64 data elements wide. Yes. And so that works really well for some things. Um, but the downside, th there's two downsides. So one is when you have a branch and some of the waves go off this way and some of the, or sorry, some of the data elements go this way and the others go this way. Well, you have to do both. And so if you have, say, one branch out of 64, mm -hmm. then in one clock you do 63 guys, and then the I other see. clock okay. you do one. So and so that's not great utilization, yeah. right? So now, uh, so that's one aspect. And then the second is that in the GCN architecture, which includes uh, Vega and Polaris, the way you would execute a wave is over four clocks. So you'd have a 16 wide SIMD, and then, you know, clock one, you do a quarter, clock mm. two, you do a quarter, clock three, you do a quarter, clock four, you're done. And then you can move on to the next instruction. So if you look at a single data element, it only makes forward progress every four clocks. Okay. Right. So, you know, say data element one, you know, you're going to do first your multiply instruction mm -hmm. and then four clocks later, you can do an add or a subtract or whatever. Um, and so if you look at its progress, it's, as I said, once every four clocks. And so the narrower part is that Navi has a 32 wide wave. And then the faster part is that the SIMDs are now 32 wide. Okay. And so you execute a full wave every clock. So if you take that same example I gave you and you look at one particular data element, 
So now you've it, got... It makes forward progress every clock. Right. So the other thing that's worth mentioning about the new Wave 32 model with Navi is that it is optional. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, it's probably going to be better for performance, but from a backwards compatibility standpoint, if you have software that was written with Wave 64, A, you can still run it, B, you can still write new software in Wave 64 if that's going to be best for you. And then behind your back, the machine will take these 64 wide waves and then issue them every other clock, essentially. So they'll, it'll split it up in a potentially, it, there's two different ways to split it up, but it'll figure out how to split it up. So, um, and, and that kind of goes back to this backwards compatibility uh, constraint that AMD has as a function of doing consoles and, and, and not wanting to disrupt the software ecosystem. And so the nice thing is, since we're talking about executing a program on all these different data items, that program will execute a lot faster. And the so you get the same flops, but it's sort of the way you're running it through the machine changes. And the benefit of this is if you think about it, so say you have a pixel shader, like you're going to have a bunch of associated state with that. Mm -hmm. You're going to need registers. You're going to need descriptors and other things that occupy space within the machine. And so if we can burn through that pixel shader 4x faster, we can free up those resources. Right. And we can use the machine with fewer data items, right? So the question is like, how many data items do you need to get the machine at 100%? And the answer is always going to be less with Navi okay. than with GCN. And so that's just going to result in better utilization. And some of so your you work- Yeah, you won't have as, as many uh, hardware fixed function units, or well, just units sitting there doing nothing, I guess, spinning, well, spinning well, their wheels. Not just fixed function units, but also your shaders, right? right? And you know, I know some of the work you did previously showed that essentially there was some underutilization of the compute resources in Vega. Yes. And so you can think of this as an architectural approach to try and fix that. Right, right. And there were also things with, uh, we saw issues with potentially cache. Yes. And so we were talking about that previously. Mm -hmm. uh, cache bandwidth is something you mentioned yeah. to me. So I'd say that's one of the, the second big changes in, in Navi. And so, you know, I think some of the work you did was great, and you pointed out that actually the biggest bang for the buck on Vega was overclocking the memory, not the computer, <laughs> right? Right? Yeah, yeah. right, and so, you know, you look at that, and, well, the data says, okay, this machine doesn't have enough bandwidth. So, at the end of the day, bandwidth is always going to come from either DRAM or cache. And so, um, the approach for Navi was to introduce another level of cache. And so if you look at GCN, including Vega, you have a cache in each compute unit that's yeah. pretty small. You have a shared L2 cache between everything that's not super big, but not super small. I mean, from a CPU standpoint, it's small. Right, CPUs right, right. are like, you know, a quarter of the die is cache. Yeah. Right, you need 10, and, 20 megabytes. And don't forget about game cache. Uh, right, so let's, <laughs> let's not talk about game cache. Oh man. Um, you know, AMD it builds fine products. Sometimes the marketing uh, <laughs> names leave a little bit to be desired. Right, that is a very kind way to say it. Yeah, so on GCN, you had an L1 cache that was pretty small per core, mm. per compute unit. And then you had this shared L2 cache, and then you had memory. Right. And so the big change in Navi is now you have an L1 cache that's actually shared between two compute units. So there's actually a way to communicate there. Uh, and then there's uh, what they call the graphics L1 cache, which is in each shader array. Okay. So, so they're different, I guess. Or yeah, okay. so, you have, so, so the, you have this sort of per core cache, mm -hmm. and then the array, there's four arrays in Navi 10. Are they physically different uh, units? Yes. On, okay. Yeah. So, so it's not just like, uh, logical partition. Yeah, it's, not, it's okay. not a logical, but it's actually a physically separate array. And it's used for slightly different things. Okay. So the, the graphics L1 cache backs up the per core L0 cache, and then it's also used by the render backends for, uh, for, for blending in depth and so forth. Okay. And so then 
In addition to that, you have the globally shared L2, and then you have DRAM like regular. So the right. nice thing is that the, this new L1 will absorb a lot of the bandwidth that previously would have spilled over to the L2, okay, I which see. then reduces the demands on memory. So the thing that's interesting is if you do out the math, um, Navi 10 has actually slightly more bandwidth than a Vega 64, but it only has 40 compute units instead of 64. So when you look at the bandwidth per core, it's actually gone up quite significantly. Okay. And so you're gonna stall in your shaders less. So from a testing perspective, mm -hmm. uh, what's, what type of workload do you, you know, in a one-to-one, -one, which we're not gonna have, but in a one-to-one, yeah. -one, where do you start to see that difference emerge in it, theory? I mean, I think just realistically, you're gonna see better scaling with respect to frequency. Okay. Right, and so it should be less uh, bottlenecked on memory, Right. we hope. And then it also has a benefit in terms of power, right? If you are getting data from SRAM on chip that is always cheaper than getting it from DRAM the on chip. The other interesting too on, on power, um, <laughs> HBM too, as much as Andy was stuck with it, uh, yeah. it was also a power play. I mean, it was yeah, lower totally. power than GDDR5. Yep. So I'm not sure what the, the numbers look like actually for G6 off the top of my head for power uh, consumption versus HBM. I mean, I'm sure it's higher, right? Yeah. So, you know, I think this is one of those things where it's a trade-off of die area, cost, cost yeah. and power. And, you know, there are folks who are willing to pay a premium for much more power efficient memory. And I think the, the challenge is that's mostly in the data center that's, and in the yeah, professional it's, it's space. It's not, not consumer, not mainstream. Right. And that HBM cost is significant. Right, so, yeah. yeah, I think, you know, it, it, we, made, it made it impossible for AMD to drop the prices, really. Right, and so from that standpoint, GDDR6 is a much more cost-effective solution right. for, for gaming and makes a ton more sense. Um, and the downside is you're gonna have to spend a little bit more power to, to get it there. And yeah. so, you know, that that's a motivator to make things more power efficient elsewhere. Yes, right? and AMD has, on the GPU side, has drawn over some of the CPU, people like Sam Nafziger, yeah. uh, to work on power for the GPUs now. Yeah. So it sounds, I don't know, it sounds like they've done a lot of work there versus Vega. Yeah, well, I think just broadly speaking, I'd say that there's, that power management in CPUs has historically been much more aggressive, much more careful than on the GPU right. side, just just kind of a, for, for PC class GPUs. Right. right. And so, you know, getting to uh, apply some of those techniques to the GPU and getting also new techniques, right? Because, you know, in CPU, you always want to go fast, but, you know, you look at something like FreeSync or um, uh, Power Chill, maybe it was. Chill, right? Yeah, chill. yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's something you can't really do in a CPU, but it's, right. you know, a very clever technique where, you know, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's okay. You know, we're in a scene where things aren't moving much, so let's just drop the frame rate, yeah. right? And it's like, well, that's a really cool trick that you can use because you understand the application. You know, oh, this actually isn't going to have an impact, and we can cut down our right. power significantly. And as a side effect, sometimes improve the uh, response, the latency too. Right, exactly. And so there's because graphics is a little bit more of a, there's more application awareness. There's mm -hmm. things that can be done there. So. It, it, anyways, the I think there's been a lot of effort invested in, in AMD, at, at NVIDIA, at Intel, at everyone in getting graphics to be much more power efficient. And so, you know, there's there's all sorts of tricks that I expect AMD will be bringing over to the GPU right. side. And then, you know, unique GPU only tricks that'll get better. So are there any closing thoughts you have on Navi in general? I mean. Power consumption is obviously one of AMD's biggest uh, punching bags, I guess, over the last couple of generations. But it's just power consumption discussion we'll have to look into more with testing. But, yeah. But TBP was 225 on the 5700 XT. Yeah. I, how do you feel about those numbers from a, from a glance? I mean, so at the end of the day, you know, I think with a lot of gamers, power is probably more of a second order thing. I, I mean, yeah, definitely. Personally, for me, you know, I actually care much more about the noise levels yes. than the power draw. 
um, except maybe on a summer day when I don't want the place heating up. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the other thing is you, you with a new architecture, you, you end up changing so many things that you may not discover all of the pain points until you have silicon and are running real workloads. Right. Um, and on the basis of that, that opens up new avenues for tuning for power. Right. And so, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, new architectures, first one in seven years. And uh, so just like with GCN, right, there was all these incremental yeah, steps yeah. with Polaris and Vega. And I'm sure there's going to be sort of a similar trajectory for Navi. And then so we'll have to see what those look like. Right. Um, but then I thought the other interesting thing is that, you know, Samsung had yes. announced that they're going to license this. That was very interesting. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's a good move for, I mean, it should support AMD where they need it, which is get, get some more guaranteed revenue in on the graphics department. Yeah. And so, you know, for those who aren't familiar with it, it's Samsung is going to be licensing the RDNA architecture for mobile. Yeah. The and, Ex Exynos uh, inclusion, I guess. Yeah, probably for high end uh, smartphones and tablets. And, you know, the truth of the matter is if you that, that that's going to put AMD's engineers under a lot of pressure to to get the power down. And yeah. so it'll be interesting to see, you know, what they develop there and how that might apply to the rest of the line. But, you know, I, I think there's uh, there's always opportunities to cut power. And it's usually a question of, you know, time and, and priorities and money. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, the nice thing is, you know, and, and let's let's be really honest. If you're making things for consoles and you're making things for for primarily desktop PCs, power is not necessarily the most critical thing. Right, right. And so I think, you know, drawing on my either cynicism or economics background, depending on your perspective, right? You know, you got to follow the money, right? And you know, if if AMD is now getting money to do mobile stuff, then then that says that someone is going to be putting power. There's dollars associated with power, yes. so we should right. expect it to improve. Yes, and and very good point on that. So, if you want to see more of David's work, we have other videos. Yeah, with David. We, we did the one on what is a core. I think yes. we talked about is a CUDA core really a core? Yeah. Uh, TLDR, no. But you should <laughs> you should watch the video from our dev. Yeah. And also realworldtech.com. You've got a forum there that uh, David's active in. Yep. And uh, mlperf.org for people interested in machine learning performance. That's right. So I think that'll wrap it for this one. Thank you for watching, David. Thank you for yep. joining me. Good to see you again. We'll see you all next time. Yep.